the EU AI Act is here and there's a lot of question concern around what needs to be done in fact questions like why do we need this regulation and how does it help the mankind the society and so on and what we're going to do is I recently had a panel discussion with uh, Dr. Anne Kawakyo, who is the creator of Privacy by Design, Nicola Fabiano, who is the ex-president of a data protection authority in San Marino, and Raghu Bala, who is the leading architect of AI courses at MIT and many other institutes, and also running his own uh, entrepreneur uh, ventures. And I had them talking about what is it that we needed EU AI Act for, or let's say, why did we need the EU AI Act? What does it bring to the table? And how does it help the society? And in this episode, I'd like to share with you that conversation we had with them. Hello, and welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast with Punit Bhatia. This is the podcast for those who care about their privacy. Here, your host, Punit Bhatia, has conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas, and opinions relating to privacy, data protection, and related matters. Be aware that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not legal advice. Let us get started. So, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Punit Bhatia. I'm a privacy and AI professional. So thank you so much for being here. And we have a very interesting lineup here. We are going to do is demystify EU AI Act. It is with us and we are going to demystify. So what do I mean by demystify? We will talk about what is EU AI Act or in fact, more importantly, why did we need it? And how do we manage or how does it make an impact for society and human mankind? To make it interesting, make it interactive, ask your questions, and we will make sure your questions come in here. Welcome, colleagues. What I, who I have with me is, if you are in the field of privacy and security, you would have heard something called privacy by design or security by design. Now, if you were ever wondering who is this and who created it, must be a very intelligent man or woman. It's a woman, and she's called Dr. Anne Kavakya. And we have the privilege of having her with us. So welcome, Anne. You're very kind. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. And then if you've been in Italy and you've seen all the provinces and you have been thinking, how does it work? Do they have data protection authority everywhere? Or is it one or so on? I can tell you there are many data protection authorities in Italy and one of them is in San Marino. Of course, I don't go into the republic or federal structure of Italy, so no remarks there but what we have with us is nicola fabiano who's ex-president of the data protection authority of san marino so welcome nicola hello everyone uh, thank you thank you punit thank you everyone uh, thank you for the invitation my pleasure and then if you are in the field of education and you ever wanted to do a degree or an ms or an engineering you would have heard about massachusetts institute of technology and you would have said, oh, wow, that's a great place. And there are great people teaching there. And one of them happens to be Raghu Bala. So he's with us and he takes care of the AI business implications or AI implications for business. That course, and I did it with him. And I was really impressed with his skills and caliber. And I'm happy to have him as well. Thank you uh, for inviting me to this panel and happy to share the stage with all the other really uh, accomplished individuals on the panel and looking forward to participating in this event. So let's get started. Thank you so much, each one of you for being here and each one of you who will come in the next panel. So let's start with the first basic question. We've been talking about AI for long, but recently there has been a lot of buzz saying AI will kill us, AI will do this, AI will do that, and we need a regulation. That was the philosophy. And there was no regulation. And then the EU AI Act came. But I want to understand from each one of you, maybe starting in the alphabetical order, why did we need this EU AI Act over and above what media has been telling us? What was the need for this act? What has changed? Because some say 
AI has been there for years, ever. Everything is, but some say something, but I see Anne is already shaking her head. So Anne, enlighten us. AI has been around for years, but not the generative AI um, that was advanced uh, last year or the year before by ChatGPT. This just grew it dramatically and it has expanded its use so widely. And this is the, the concern that people in privacy and security have, because what a lot of this AI does is it goes to hundreds, thousands of websites, databases, et cetera, and just extracts all the information contained, including personally identifiable data. So it doesn't just extract information about what I'm doing or who I'm with or things of that nature. It identifies that it's Anne Kabukian engaged in all these activities. And that is just such an egregious transgression of privacy. Privacy is all about control, personal control relating to the use and disclosure of your personally identifiable data. And in this context, generative AI, the way it's taking place now has just left privacy far behind. So I think what we're trying to do is play catch up. I think that's what you're seeing with the EU, the AI Act, and now the US, is mirroring that, working with the EU, and it's beginning to grow dramatically. And thank God, because we're already behind the gate. We're, we're lagging behind. AI of this nature is manifesting itself everywhere. And people love it because it facilitates so many activities and actions, etc., makes life easier for a lot of people. But you end up relinquishing all control in terms of your personal information, your identity, and that is completely unacceptable. So as I've always said, you have to look under the hood. We have to look at how can we apply privacy by design, which is all about being proactive in an effort to prevent the privacy and security harms from arising. So that's what I'm looking at. Okay. And Nicola, your view on the same thing? Why did we need this EU AI Act? Well, um, it's uh, challenging to discuss uh, relevant topics in a short time, but I try to to describe my point of view. Uh, yes, I think that I agree with uh, comments from Anna. Uh, I want to explain uh, my point of view in three short points, uh, three pros and three cons. Uh, the first one, Pros is uh, that AI represents a highly complex phenomenon with uh, exponential uh, growth and expansion, transversely um, involving several areas with significant impacts, and mainly is not a recent innovation. Uh, probably um, I will explain uh, later uh, what I mean. The second point uh, is that AI needs a multidisciplinary approach with uh, professionals from different sectors. And the third pros is regulating the use of AI systems, not AI, is uh, a good thing to, guarantees, uh, to guarantee each individual's fundamental rights. Uh, moving to the three main cons and criticalities, uh, uh, the first one I think is over legislation. The AI Act stems from the European Digital Strategy, which includes uh, the Artificial Intelligence Strategy. Europe has published over 100 acts in the digital sphere, but the risk of over legislation is to generate disorientation. The second point, the second cons is uh, wrong competitiveness. With the AI Act, Europe wanted to further demonstrate its digital sovereignty, but this is a short-sighted vision because it does not take into account what is happening in the rest of the world. I am referring to the United States, Ch China, India, etc., for researchers and business. With the AI Act, Europe wanted to show the world that it was a leader in adopting, in adopting AI legislation. The third uh, cons is warnings. Uh, eminent scientists working on AI for years, I am referring to Stuart Russell, uh, Peter Norvig, Max Stermark, and others, highlighted the warnings about the considerable risks arising from the distorted use of AI systems 
even described as uh, autonomous weapon systems. On that point, the EU oversight model do not consider other equally interesting as described in some research. Okay. And Raghu, what would be your view on why do we need this EU AI regulation or AI regulation in general also? Sure. So uh, basically, I'll just go quickly. So building upon what Anne said, okay, now AI itself, you should split into two parts, discriminative AI and generative AI. Discriminative AI, the answers are very determinate. In uh, Generative AI, the answers are indeterminate. So you don't know what the next token is going to give you. So now what happens is now once you have indeterminate answers, now comes into play social, moral, and ethical implications. So you need to have some guardrails in order to control what AI is going to do next because you cannot predict what it's going to do. So, if, for example, if you go into chat GPT and you give uh, the same prompt twice, you'll get two different answers because it's not discriminate. Uh, it's not determinate. It's, it can be... Um, you know, it can give you a different answer each time. So now with that, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So you need to figure out how to put some uh, some constraints around this problem. And that's why, uh, you know, governments all over the world are starting to feel like, okay, now what was kind of, you know, can be controlled is now sort of like not controllable. So we've got to put some some regulations around it so that it doesn't get out of hand. That's That's what's prompting the EU to act. Um, and one other point is data is the fuel for AI. Okay, that's known. But the data itself can be very biased. So, for example, I was in Africa uh, a couple of months ago at a conference. I was a keynote speaker. And the problem is the data and the LLM models and so on, they are trained on Western data. It's got nothing to do with Africa. It's got no relevance to the people there or their culture or anything like that. So now what happens is data can get very biased and so on. So again, uh, the need for regulation is to protect the people who are going to be subject to AI uh, from any sort of prejudice and bias and those types of things as well. So there's a number of reasons why the EU has acted. And I think it's quite good. At least someone is uh, beginning to put some framework around this thing. And I think it's a positive move. But like what Nicola said, you cannot get too far uh, uh, into it such that you start to, you know, prevent um, technology from progressing by putting so many rigid rules that it cannot breathe. So you've got to have a kind of a balance in this. I agree with you. A balance is needed because typically we say technology leads and laws lag because technology gives us new things which we need to control, which we need to regulate, and then we create laws. And by the time we create a law, the technology has already moved forward so it's always a catch-up that we are playing but again ai needs to be good ai needs to be good for the society and mankind and that's why we have to give it some direction give it some shape so talking about that what is this eu ai act about because we all know it's a risk-based approach which we will delve into in the second panel but what is it this eu ai act about, all about because uh, Give us a perspective, a short one, and then we will see. Sure, if you want me to start. Um, if you look at the way the EU acts, generally speaking, you look at the GDPR that was passed and things of that nature, uh, personal control, retaining a sense of control over the use uh, and disclosure of your personal data is critical. So the AI Act, uh, they're trying to preserve that, that we need to preserve some sense of control over who gains access to our personally identifiable data uh, without having sought our consent or anything of that nature. So it's trying to prevent the automatic um, extraction of all information in databases around the world uh, without any notion of personal control or consent or any of that. So it's trying to regain some kind of uh, balance like that because it's been totally lost with AI and now we're trying to get it back. So I think that's one of the major goals of the AI Act is trying to understand that you can't just go and extract whatever information you want from whatever databases for purposes of AI. That's not acceptable. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I think it's the same thing what GDPR did, trying to bring control to the user. It's the same way in AI, we want to put the user 
in control of and being able to be aware of what's happening because you don't want a mission impossible scenario that a robot takes over the world and of course that can virtually happen but we want to avoid that in so far possible so maybe this time i ask ragu first ragu what's your view on what is this eu ai act all about so so what happens is you know there are two major prongs and i'm i won't take the thunder away from the second panel but the first prong is a risk based approach right so that second panel can talk about the details of that approach but they are talking about risk and so they classify risk into high risk uh, you know no unacceptable risk high risk uh, medium risk and then like no no or low risk okay that's the uh, framework the second thing that they are worried about is transparency so let me talk about that a little bit more so transparency one of the problems is once machines or automatons are controlling uh, you know actions you want to know why they arrived at a particular action so that's ai observability or this transparency that we are talking about now once the thing that ann is talking about which is very important which is once the machines are sort of like you know you're worried about they're getting out of control how do you control the word control means if you know why it arrived at a decision that transparency once you can figure out how it arrived at a decision that the control choke point that you have to hold on to once you cannot one is once it's not transparent you don't know how it arrived at actions and this is what elon musk is always worried about he keeps saying that you know what machines are, you know might take over because you cannot figure out what they did once you cannot figure out what they did then you are in trouble so i think regulation has to has to control this part because once you know it's transparent and observable then it's within sort of like a, a framework that we can as humans figure out what happened and, and that's very important for ai that's that's very true i think explainability that means being able to explain what is done in a transparent and a simple language which user can understand and at the right moment prompting it at the right time because you don't say i'm installing alexa and it keeps asking me for one day all the prompts to say agree 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 that doesn't work you need to ask the right prompt at the right time and be being able to explain this is what it means for me but nikola so what is your view because you're also working with the lawmakers in the eu yeah what is this eu regulation all about what's the objective behind it um an and ragu already said um, something about uh, i don't want to sound very critical today but i would like to stress some um some points related to uh, to uh, um, to when the ai act doesn't apply and uh, because there are some concerns related to the exempt exemptions uh, particularly uh, military ai system uh, development began for operational uh, activities in the military and the concerns are the risks of the development of use of dangerous ai systems and their possible availability to civil society where they may be misused what about the government competence regarding the military sphere the regulation falls within the competence of governments this point raises a, a great question how much can governments maintain accountable behavior and pay attention to those concerns without rules and guarantees for the individuals this is another point this is a 1 billion dollar question uh the third point is uh, police and judicial cooperation on this point uh, one cannot overlook the doubts about the impact of ai uh, of high risk ai systems on individuals two main questions what about in case in case of urgency what guarantees are there for individuals fundamental rights and freedoms in case for example of biases with no rules especially on human oversight and consequent possible errors the the fourth uh, point is uh, scientific research and development purposes and research testing or development activities Uh, so that exemption may be a balanced solution that aims to provide some guarantees but might reduce and limit research activities three questions uh, will researchers and scientists be available to work only to reach scientific results and acquire data on project that will never be put into production does that make sense 
who will control them? I mean, project and researchers in that case. So some few uh, points uh, when uh, in, in the cases of uh, the AI Act doesn't apply. Makes sense. And I think this is the right moment. Somebody, somebody has asked a very good question in the chat saying, do lawmakers and regulators have sufficient technical expertise? And even understanding the craft of effective lawmaking and comprehensive lawmaking, especially as AI is a rapidly govern, rapidly changing and complex field. Well, that is not only a challenge for lawmakers, but also for us. But and of course not. I mean, lawmakers and regulators have an, a broad understanding of what is important and what must be preserved in terms of rights and not relinquished. But then, of course, you have to work with the brilliant tech community um, to engage them to apply this in, a, in any kind of real sense. You know, I always say you have to look under the hood in terms of whatever the technology is involved. You have to uh, ensure that the, the technical staff that you have have an understanding of what you're trying to achieve in terms of your goals of preserving privacy, preserving security, but not standing in the way of advancing uh, the interests of AI uh, in, in non-personally identifiable data. You know, privacy by design is all about, it, it's not zero sum, privacy versus whatever. It's privacy and whatever the business interest is, privacy and security, it's and. You need to have that. So when I work with technical people to convey this, I start there and I say, I'm not trying to get rid of this. I want to make sure it works in a way that respects privacy and preserves personally identifiable data, etc. And when you can explain it to them, they can figure out how to do it. I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy task with AI, but this is doable. But you definitely need technical, brilliant staff. I think uh, that's a very uh, well-rounded answer. But I like to give a completely different spin. In a company, we have a CEO. He does not know each and every department. Maybe he's a specialist from HR, from risk, from compliance, from sales, from operations, from business. But he does not know each and every business. And you cannot expect them to be uh, expert in privacy, AI, and so on. Same way, the lawmakers or the governments are not expected to be an expert on each and everything. And as Anne emphasized, it's the role of the government to make laws while going to the technical experts and reach out to the community of technical experts. And that's how the laws are framed. And yes, at certain times in some countries, there may be some things which we will say, this is not okay and that is not okay. But that's part and parcel of the game because that's what we say sometimes about our CEOs also. So let's not uh, get that far ahead. I don't see any more question there, but so we can maybe get to the other part of the thing is that is around how does this EU AI Act help the society because what we're talking about is it's for the society we want to manage the social moral and ethical aspects of ai so how does a regulation like eu ai act help us in achieving that and maybe if this time if it's okay i start you with nicola if it's okay okay well the ai act helps the internal market and probably our society according to the subject matter in article one however uh, we must be positive and consider that there will be uh, guarantees for individuals due to the human-centric approach the ai act explains that uh, it is a general framework and does not provide management system solutions so we should refer to some international standards like ISO uh, IEC uh, 41000 and others. Uh, but I want to stress a relevant point, uh, which is the liability. The AI Act doesn't regulate liability depending on AI systems. Liability depends, of course, on the legal systems and those for Europe uh, on a regulatory source governing liability arising from artificial intelligence and uh, for each member state uh, or national legislation. The European Commission published two proposals on September 28, 2022, notably a proposal for a directive on liability for de defective products 
and the second pro uh, proposal for a directive on adapting the rules on non-contractual civil liability to artificial intelligence. On this point, European Data Protection Supervisor expressed uh, its view in opinion uh, 42 2023, which included some suggestions. There might be uh, some criticalities related to the transposition stage due to the national legislator will have to consider the domestic legal framework and uh, so the introduction of uh, an AI system liability at national level could conflict with the existing domestic legal framework. This is my, my, pers my perspective. That's uh, interesting. And I'd like to move to Raghu, if it's okay. Sure. So, so one of the things that I uh, teach in the course, actually, I, sh I share this video that I post in the course. It's about a robot. And the robot is actually given a problem. Uh, and the problem is, uh, you, it's like in a self-driving car scenario, and you have two choices to make. You can get into an accident where you can hurt the passengers in the car, or you can hit a pedestrian and injure or kill the pedestrian. Now, the, this is a dilemma for the robot, okay, because it doesn't know which one do I go? One way, I'll hurt the passengers. The other way, I would hurt someone outside the car. So these are types of things where, why I'm mentioning this, uh, there's no real correct answer to this, but why I'm mentioning this example is because once AI is actually being introduced uh, into the public domain, uh, self-driving cars, self-driving trucks are already uh, uh, running in North America, and the public is involved. And, and they might get into like accidents or claims or insurance or litigation or whatnot, but they need to understand how these systems operate. And, um, and I think um, uh, the more uh, knowledge is spread among the, the society about how these systems uh, engage, that's very, very important. Another thing that, you know, uh, on the how part of it, which I am a proponent of, I don't know if many people are, but a lot of AI systems are still very centralized in the sense that uh, big companies are controlling these AI engines, the data that govern these AI engines. One of the things I propose is that we use blockchain a little bit more because blockchain is transparent, it's outside of, uh, it's not, it's decentralized, and this would uh, improve the transparency quotient of the system so that anyone can inspect the data and so on, especially if it's for the public good the public needs to be able to see that data if they so desire. But right now, what happens is a lot of it is behind the curtains of large companies which control these systems, and no one knows what has gone into the data to make them act a particular way. So, so that part of it, I think, you know, soon there'll be some sort of understanding of how the systems work, and legislation should, should try to at least bring about that transparency, and blockchain is a very good mechanism to make that happen. Sure. And how do you think this EU AI Act is helping the society at large? I think it's providing some comfort uh, in the sense that certainly people I've spoken to all around the world, including the EU, of course, um, are getting very nervous about AI. They're getting nervous about what's happening to their personal information. Uh, where does it reside? You know, there are data brokers everywhere. There's all kinds of information out there that is available to AI in terms of being extracted, et cetera. And so it, people are very concerned these days with their information. The EU AI Act will give them some level of comfort that the government is trying to do something to protect your data while enabling AI to take place because AI will bring multiple gains as well. So I think it's very positive in that sense um, transparency is important, what's taking place, trust, which has been lacking for quite a while, will hopefully be restored somewhat. And it's it's just baby steps at this point, but I think it will give certainly the public a greater level of comfort than they had before. I can agree with you. It's a step that will create comfort. And there, sometimes people ask, and someone has already asked in context of the bias because what happens is data that is being fed to the models is usually biased or it's not 100% okay. 
Now, even if we say we will clean data and it will still be biased because it's dependent on the person cleaning the data and that the person also has inherent or subconscious bias. So how can we reach in AI system something called a, the person is asking 100%, but I would say reasonable bias and fairness. Anyone wants to take that? Uh, I can give a shot. So can you just repeat the question one more time quickly? Basically, a person is saying, how do we reach a state wherein the data is not biased and we remove dependence on people? Yeah. So, so first of all, um, you need to know which is the demographic you're using the data for. Okay. So it has to reflect the demographic it's used, uh, the context and demographic it's used for. So if I'm going to subject AI to some audience in North America, then it has to reflect that particular populace. So if I'm going to put it in some part of Asia or whatnot, it has to reflect that. That's number one, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, that would remove the sort of like uh, bias of the underlying data. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, like uh, uh, transparency itself, I mentioned, you know, I think data is currently being collected and, and not sometimes not cleansed in any way and also uh, hidden behind closed doors of companies that if you put it out in, uh, in, in blockchain and so on and for public uh, uh, inspectability, that's one thing. One thing about what Anne mentioned earlier, uh, PII information, personally identifiable information needs to be somewhat, uh, what they call it, there's a word for it, it skips me right now, but basically you hide that part of it, okay? You don't need to show that part. You can uh, put pseudonyms or you know block that part of it, don't need to know who it came from, but that would uh, at least uh, protect the privacy, but still making the data valuable for learning so that uh, future generations or whatnot can leverage the data to make decisions, which is what we all want to get to. Um, but I think there are mechanisms in place. Uh, it's just that getting all the players who are collecting this data, which happens to be all the big uh, name brand uh, companies, you, you all know what run platforms for e-commerce, for search, for other things, that they need to come to a table to play. Right now, they are using data as their way of making money. And uh, that needs to maybe stop. And, and that's, I think, one of the questions on the panel that I see is about AI and Web3. So Web3 is all about um, sharing. It's not about hoarding. And right now, we are in the hoarding mode among the large companies. So uh, if we can move the needle toward sharing, and then you can get to the um, transparency and removal of bias and all those types of things. Thanks, Raghu. And it seems you want to add something. My only concern with the notion of sharing, which I, I am very fond of, is again, you, ha you have to share in the context of non-personally identifiable data. Yeah. Then you are free to do whatever you want with the data. That's why I always say privacy and data utility go hand in hand as long as you remove the personal identifiers. So then I'm all for it. And I work with many companies to enable that to happen, to make sure they can benefit from their data in, in a variety of ways without risking the privacy of their customers or subjects or whoever's involved. Yeah, that makes sense. And... There's another question in the context of how, that how can we have consistent and harmonized laws that are applied across jurisdictions to avoid a patchwork of regulations or vacuum of legal frameworks when it comes to technologies operating on global scale? Now that goes similar to what we had in the GDPR. The GDPR came in and now we have 100 plus law countries replicating it. In a way, it's a consistent standard being replicated, but in another way, everyone wants to be different. So they change the 20% of it, name it differently and all that and create that uh, variety of or spaghetti of laws, as we call it. Anyone wants to take that? Yes, um, uh, everybody knows that uh, the AI Act uh, will be a regulation in Europe. So uh, it uh, will apply in all uh, 27 member states, European member states. But if we uh, discuss about uh, uh, a global, um, so a, a global legislation, uh, I want to I want to highlight that uh, um, the UN group of experts uh, 
published an interim report uh, uh, about the governance, the AI governance at the global level. And uh, they considered that uh, the AI Act and the President Biden's executive order on AI uh, are both uh, governance models. Um, and uh, they hope for the fulfillment of a worldwide one. Um, from my perspective, I, so I, I remain deeply skeptical of uh, the feasibility of a worldwide AI governance model, primarily due to the formidable challenge presented by each country's steadfast desire for its own AI um, sovereignty and uh, the potentially disruptive effects of divergent regulations. And uh, from my perspective, the equation representing global governance as impossible is many laws and fewer opportunities. Actually, I'll just add one more thing. Uh, it's kind of funny, Larry Ellison from Oracle, actually, he brought up something a couple of weeks ago as a news release. And he talked about, you know, there's, you know, in GDPR, there's something called data residency, right? Every country needs to maintain its own data and so on. And the EU, it's like, it's considered one big block. So as long as your data centers within the EU, it's okay. You know, like Facebook got fined, I think, quite a lot of money, a few billion dollars for shipping data back to US uh, from EU without data residency within, within US, uh, within EU. Now, the, the thing that Larry brought up was that in the future, because AI is so important to, like what Nicola mentioned about uh, military and, you know, sovereignty and, you know, uh, security of a country and things like that, he talked about actually each country trying to um, maintain the, uh, the data centers within their own country so that the yeah. AI is not going to, you know, bleed into, our, even within you, it might be within separate countries. So it's not going to bleed outside of, um, of of your region. So that's going to be very important. And um, I think that poses, uh, you know, in, in the business context, there's a lot of um, opportunity as well. But you have to maintain your data within your own boundaries and things like that. That's going to be very big. Uh, because once it starts bleeding, then uh, then you lose control of it. So, so that's going to be a big theme going forward. I think data sovereignty is an interesting topic and maybe Anne, you would have a view on that because you're talking to a lot of regulators and governments. Data sovereignty is, is very important. There's no question. But regardless of where you are, whatever jurisdiction you're in, the notion of privacy and data protection is very simple. And, and to me, it doesn't relate to sovereignty at all. It relates to data subjects, their personally identifiable information, whether they can retain personal control. Privacy is all about control relating to the use and disclosure of your personal information. So that's the way I view it um, as opposed to sovereignty. And you know, when the EU comes out with legislation like the GDPR and now the EU AI Act, other countries try to, uh, if not mirror it, certainly work with it, match it. I know the U.S. is working on an AI act and all that. So I think that's very important. But the, the notion of sovereignty to me is, is far more related to individuals' personal control than anything else. I think sovereignty for me can be interpreted in many ways. Like one is the data sovereignty in itself, the data confidentiality, integrity, and availability is maintained. Second is the sovereignty in terms of the individual. What does he want to do? Does he have control over it or not? Then it's the state or the country or the jurisdiction. What control do they have? And then, of course, physically, where does the data reside? So it has. it's a very complex and uh, complicated topic, and AI doesn't help in that. But put it, if I can add, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I don't disagree with you with all the layers you identified. But whenever I, I talk to governments, you know, the I was privacy commissioner here for three terms. And what I say to them is it's all about the individual's personal information and their ability to retain control over mm -hmm. its use and disclosure. That's at the heart of it. Then you can add all kinds of layers of different things and laws in various countries and how they work together. But in my view, that has to be at the heart of it. Okay. 
And that is completely agreeable because if you put that in right order, the individual in the control, rest of it can be taken care. And yeah. now I understand why you think that simply because you are putting the person in charge and then if person is in wherever the country is taken care of. Yes, thank you. And uh, no, but it's always exciting uh, talking to you and how you simplify things. And <laughs> then there's another question which we've always been talking about responsible AI and trustworthy AI and taking ethics also into consideration. I know and you're working on ethics by design nowadays. So I ask you or trust by design as you call it sometimes. So what's your take on this, on the responsible AI, trustworthy AI and ethics into AI? I don't want to take over. I want to make sure the gentlemen also have an opportunity to speak. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'll keep my answer really short. And then once again, it relates to, um, you know, ethics by design, privacy by design, security by design. It's all about the individual retaining control and having an understanding of how their data is going to be used. You know, when you think of ethics by design, it's all about how is my data being used by whom and for what purposes? Transparency is very, very important for people to have an, an understanding of how their data will be used. And then they can make decisions relating to their desire to consent to that or not. Makes sense. Ragu or Nico, yeah. uh, Nicola, you want to add something to that? So I've uh, this. Uh, yeah, go please, ahead. please. Yeah, so I'd say in terms of AI itself, I mean, this these regulations have to be somewhat malleable. I'll tell you why. Because AI is not static, right? AI is, the by definition, machine learning. That means it learns and it morphs and it changes. So whatever laws that are passed have to be within, uh, you know, have to understand that you are talking about a, not like other technologies, which are pretty static. Once it's carved in stone, it's, it's like that. Here, it's going to change, okay? And so what happens is, if we talk about responsible AI, trust for the AI, uh, let's say that the first iteration of some system, let's say you're uh, talking about self-driving cars or whatever, just as an example, it might perform a particular way. And there might be some accidents, there might be some issues. Now, what has to happen is the laws have to allow for the system to sort of uh, learn from its mistakes and improve itself and, and that way what happens is over time, the trust between the AI and the human population, society and so on will start to grow because it will be a feedback loop that is continuously happening. And that's very, very important for AI because unlike a lot of other technologies which don't change so often, this almost changes with data, almost changes uh, in real time. And, and so, so I would say that we cannot be so critical of AI from the get go, we have to give it a little bit of a uh, little bit of rope in order for it to to learn and improve itself as well. That makes sense. And Nicola, you wanted to add also. Uh, yes, briefly, um, I agree with Ragu and Nan, and uh, I want to add only that um, AI uh, is is an umbrella, and uh, we should talk about AI systems because the AI Act regulates AI systems. We do not confuse AI with AI systems. This is the first point. The second point is that ethics is a critical, a very critical point. In a recent paper I published on LLMs, I, I highlighted that uh, uh, the need of uh, consider also, apart from the uh, human oversight, the ethical oversight, because uh, 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 if we consider the processes of uh, mm, that uh, uh, an AI system uh, 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 does, uh, we we, sh we cannot mm, ignore the uh, the approach, uh, uh, the human, uh, the ethical oversight approach. And uh, on this point, uh, um, I think that. Uh, it could be opportune to make evaluation to ensure um, so ethical oversights and mitigation regarding uh, protected categories, intersectionalities, and vulnerable people uh, populations. That makes sense. Now, in essence of time, 
I wanted to normally ask you two things. How can companies comply with it? One thing for them to do and also your one final message. But if I ask that, we will be running over time. So what I will ask you is to combine the two and say, what would be your one final message towards organizations who want to comply with it? How in, sh I mean, of course, it's a long process, but in your view, what would be or how would be the starting towards the journey on compliance towards AI regulation, not only EU AI Act and maybe a bit more broader? The, the one message I would like to get across um, is to law enforcement, because people think that the police can just go in and extract whatever information they want uh, when they have a case or not. No, what I always say to the police and, and to others is if you have solid grounds for gaining access to someone's personal information, you go to court, get a warrant. If you have a warrant, that is your legal means by which to gain access to personally identifiable data. Short of a warrant, you don't have any greater right than anyone else to gain the public's uh, right of access to people's personal information. So I think that's critical. Uh, the other issues, transparency, companies, organizations have to be very clear what they're doing with your personal information, especially in the context of AI. And who else may be gaining access to that information without your knowledge or consent? That should not be permitted. And I would seek ways to have that imposed. So putting people in control of things. And may I go to Nicola and ask what would be your message? Uh, briefly, um, I suggest to consider uh, training courses for everyone involved with the companies, uh, AI processes, uh, and uh, um, also um, I suggest to uh, to evaluate assessing a, a AI risk, AI system, and uh, f mm, another point is to consider uh, the data used by an AI, AI system and whether they meet the quality criteria and uh, if they are accurate. Um, last, um, I think that uh, it's necessary to act soon and uh, not wasting time uh, to, to wait uh, uh, <laughs> the application, the concrete application of the AI Act, because we uh, are experienced with the GDPR uh, the the ai act uh, the first application is uh, six months uh, so uh, we are ready <laughs> and uh, this is my suggestions thank you for definitely start now don't wait and ragu yeah so just uh, briefly i'd say that you know the uh, the way the act has been uh, constructed it requires one to uh, assess the applications according to risk criteria so I, I believe that the same companies who are doing GDPR and SOC2 compliance and so on will start to add uh, EU Act uh, AI compliance among the, the list of uh, compliance activities that they do, these uh, assessment companies and so on. So whoever's in enterprise, when they want to um, launch an application, they might want to put an extra step in the launch process to say that, okay, we finished coding, we finished testing, but let's now go for compliance testing to make sure that in which category that our app sort of like uh, fits within. They might want to do it at the tail end as well as at the beginning. At the beginning, they want to make sure that they're not going to build an application which is in the unacceptable risk criteria because it won't, won't pass that, that uh, EU AI Act compliance anyway. So you want to figure out where you sit within those four categories and then plan accordingly or whatever IT project and then launch it so that you launch something which is going to meet the standards that have been imposed by the EU. That's very well said. I think you're saying compliance by design or risk by design. So, <laughs> okay. So if we were to wrap up in few words, I would say you have said that in view of the generative AI and the discriminative AI that's coming up and the challenges it poses to society, morals and ethics, we do need an EU AI Act or a act or a regulation and it does not solve all challenges so the challenges around liability copyright ip all those will remain there will be other laws so everything works in conjunction and in view of the privacy of individuals it's very important to put people in control of their data so we are in a way extending what was the basis or the fundamental of 
the privacy laws of the GDPR into AI Act and making it more realistic in context of the systems, because now the systems are, some of the systems are going to be autonomous and they're going to generate data and create more challenges for us. That's what we are saying. And we are also saying, do not wait to act, start now and start as you started with your privacy or GDPR, start reading, understanding the law, converting it into a policy, then governance, and then step-by-step step maintaining a log of your systems. And that's where all of us are here to help you. And I would with that say, thank you so much, Anne, Nicola, Raghu, for your wonderful insights. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks for listening. If you liked the show, feel free to share it with a friend and write a review. If you have already done so, thank you so much. And if you did not like the show, don't bother and forget about it. Take care and stay safe. Fit for Privacy helps you to create a culture of privacy and manage risks by creating, defining, and implementing a privacy strategy that includes delivering scenario-based training for your staff. We also help those who are looking to get certified in CIPPE, CIPM, and CIPT through on-demand courses that help you prepare and practice for certification exam. Want to know more? Visit www.fitforprivacy.com. That's www.fit, the number four, privacy.com. If you have questions or suggestions, drop an email at hello at fitforprivacy.com. Until next time, goodbye.